I have nothing else to do. Oh, the Knox are making an album. Sure, I'll try to write something for it. And like, usually they're always on tour. They're finishing their record. They're like on vacation. You know what I mean? Like, especially the bigger artists. Right. You could no one had any excuses. Everyone was, we knew you were at home. Like, we know you're home now. <laughs> um, so basically, this is about you and your journey in music, and uh, obviously starting with the Knox and how you guys got to where you are now. And I, and I love the new song that you just put out. So we'll talk about that one as well. Okay. Cool, cool. cool. Um, well, are you, you guys started in New York? Are you born and raised in New York? Uh, I am not. I'm actually born in Vermont originally, uh, and I moved to New York for college. I, uh, and James was from the Bronx, but went to high school in uh, Connecticut. So, you know, when we both met, it was like our first times. We were both getting an apartment in New York City. Like I was a freshman in college and he was uh, also a freshman, but going to St. John's, but wanted to live in the city, blah, blah. We uh, ended up being roommates because we had a mutual friend that went to school with me. Um, oh, yeah, so that's like kind of how it all started. So that was my first time in New York. J-Pad, I kind of like, you know, he was from the Bronx and like used to come in when he was younger because he was from Connecticut and shit, so it was closer. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we were both like, like in the grand scheme of things, it was basically our, both our first times really like living in downtown New York City and kind of cut our teeth together and kind of learning the ways of getting your electricity cut off <laughs> and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> prior to the, prior to you know getting to new york and and starting this what was your musical like upbringing did you were your parents into music or how'd you get into music yeah my uh my parents were huge music fans mm -hmm. like not no one played an instrument but uh my sister played drums and that got me actually into playing drums and she actually put me onto like the whole world of our alternative music kind of she she was one of those you know she was like a 90s kid but was really into the real uh kind of punk and indie hardcore punk like all those zines and stuff from back in the day, like, oh, yeah. it, like, like Bikini Kill and Seven Year Bitch and L7, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then also loved like the Beastie Boys and like DJ Shadow and like kind of the cool stuff and the more electronic side of things. And uh, I would just like, you know, as any little younger brother, you take their CDs. <laughs> and uh, that's like, it's the only way you can kind of find your own stuff is from your older siblings. Mm -hmm. So I remember taking a lot of, honestly, like one of the most influential ones that I got from her, shout out to Carly, she's watching this um was the dj shadow cd introducing which was like a very it's my first time hearing an album that was like oh there's not songs it's like these beats and instrumentals and it's like kind of elements of rap music but then also these like beautiful old samples from things and it kind of opened my eyes to that whole producer as an artist world you know and like especially dj like i was still a dj then i was really into hip-hop djing like scratching and doing that whole side of things and and it kind of like was like oh you can like do this and not just like play middle school dances like what I was doing at the time you know it's like mm -hmm. you can like you can like make music out of this without being without playing a guitar or without being a singer which I I just like was always more interested in like the production side of things mm -hmm. um so that kind of opened up those whole doors for me and it kind of just like made me want to make kind of more weird electronic leaning music um mm -hmm. which turned into just kind of beat making and turned into hip-hop and then kind of turned back to electronic music James grew up in a family totally different. I think he's actually jumping on now um, with a bunch of musicians in it. Like his parents both were in the church and teaching instruments. So he played uh, keys and drums at a really young age. So that's why it's kind of interesting. Um, when we met, it was like, I didn't know how to play an instrument basically. Now I do, but at the time I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I was like really into this whole other genre that he didn't, you know, he was like Earth, Wind and Fire and Michael Jackson. And I was listening to like, uh, like, you know like no effects and punk rock and then also like bruce springsteen and shit from my parents mixed with like fat boy slim and all that stuff so it's like all these genres coming together which i think is kind of a reason why our stuff ended up sounding so good and we didn't really butt heads on anything because i'd be like those chords are cool i can't play anything at l so you'll do the chords and i'll do oh, this it's okay like so kind of you know what i mean it just kind of mm -hmm. like it, it was like two minds from two completely different places so it really worked out well mm-hmm when, when you wrote to back up a little bit, you talked about DJing and uh, middle school dances or you did the whole scratching yeah. thing. So you must have got a turntable at an early age. You got to get the needles oh, yeah. and actually scratch too. Like, how did you, yeah. like, how old were you when you started doing that? I was 13 when I got my first, like, I kind of, when I learned what DJing was like with the, the turntables and everything, I think I, my, I had like a friend who had a friend from New York city, like brought literally like a catalog in and you like, look, you know, you can order stuff online at the time. So like you look at these these catalogs and all the stuff was so expensive, obviously, for like my mom was about to buy me that stuff. So I obviously took my parents turntable, like the old, you know, and just like 
took their first record and went like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then slowly I, I learned, I like got some gear, like had a friend that had some and kind of played with it. And then I started selling weed, which funded my early DJ career okay. as, a, as a public school <laughs> kid in, in New Hampshire. It was, uh, it was very funny. It was like, I, you know, cause I, had, I couldn't afford this stuff. My parents had no idea how much it costs. I mean, they know by now, this is no secret, but uh, they didn't know how much this stuff costs. So I'd be ordering it on these catalogs and like some like $300 turntable would come in the mail and they'd, I'd be like, yeah, this was like 20 bucks. You know what I mean? And like, not totally. Yeah. It was, it was so a funny get away with way more before the internet, honestly. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> what was your first turntable? Did you, I, I, well, I had a turntable growing up because I tried to do that thing and I was just yeah. awful at it. And a buddy of mine would come over and use it and he got really good. I ended up uh, really kind of going that route. But uh, yeah, I did the DMCs and the whole thing. Like A track was the judge when I was 13. I competed um, in Boston, drove like three hours and got top 10 when I was 13. Wow. This, this whole big, yeah, I was like, I was like super into it. I spent hours in my room and I wish I could honestly get some of those hours back because I don't really use those <laughs> skills anymore. <laughs> I wish I'd been teaching myself like guitar or something. But it, in the long run, it's like it's a you know it's all part of the process. Um, but my first up table was probably it was the Gemini, I think. Like one oh of those yeah, belts. I remember like the Gemini. Belt. It was a belt or a direct drive. Yeah, it's definitely belt because I couldn't okay. afford the. Drive. And then when I got finally got twelve hundred, it's like oh my god, this is like this is what they're supposed to be like. Because the belt one, you like pull the record back and the whole thing would be like rrr, rrr, and like when. They were so soft and like so like they just felt cheap, you know. Oh, here you right, is. yeah. You'd pull, you'd pull, yeah. You'd pull the record and it had to like catch up, right? It'd be like, Brrr. yeah. The whole thing would stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yo, hey. hey, sorry about that. The link wasn't working for me for whatever reason. Oh, it's all good. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for I'm, having me. I, I'm Adam, uh, and we were we were kind of started a little bit just. Uh, hearing Ben's story. Basically, this podcast is about you both and how right you, you met and got into music. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll jump over to you in, in just a second, Jay. Yeah, just keep, That's cool. keep going. At it like <laughs> okay. day, so. No, no yeah. worries. Um, no, so Ben, you, you were you were like, like serious into it. I mean, you were competing and everything. Like you do yeah, like with the that, crab and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. I was big and <laughs> struggling. And I'd buy five copies of every record because they get they get worn out, you know, and I used to do it performing my like school talent shows and stuff. Um, and that's like what I wanted to do. I wanted to be like Hubert or like a track and those dudes who are just like doing shows and, and scratching and uh, all that stuff. And then it slowly turned into just like production and making beats. And that's like what I wanted to, then I was like, I kind of wanted to be like DJ Premier where like mm -hmm. I make beat and, and do the, and scratch on the, like I put out two mixtapes as a kid that were just like me scratching on the choruses and then, but I made the beat and there would be a rapper. And then slowly I just kind of got more into like the idea of, of making the full song, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I learned how to like arrange a song and put it together and whatever. And I feel like that was just kind of like the first step into becoming like an actual producer. And slowly I started scratching less and less and then, <laughs> got a got like you know i moved to new york city and started djing at clubs like my day job just like playing at whatever open format and stuff and that kind of opened my eyes to just even more genres of stuff and you know more dance music kind of that whole scene in new york with with kind of the the bloggy brooklyn scene with all the mm -hmm. cool uh, electro stuff and all that and that kind of got me into electronic music um I remember at a young age having, having the daft punk homework album because my friend was from had actually moved to my school from france oh wow and he, and he had homework and I was like this is crazy like I didn't understand it like I remember being like I don't you know I was listening to like Green Day at the time and I was like <laughs> what the hell is this I was like there's no it's like because it wasn't like the DJ shadow stuff or whatever where it felt like hip hoppy and it didn't feel like at the time you'd call everything else like techno or trance or whatever you know it was like Euro pop shit this just had a whole nother vibe to it I remember just thinking around the world is like I just, it's like a weird, it's a crazy thing. Cause you still put those records on like Daft Punk and it still feels so fresh. And there's something about the way it's mixed and the way it sounds. It just like mm -hmm. sounds like otherworldly, you know? And I just mm -hmm. remember, I just remember hearing that as a kid and like, just like not the, the feeling of not being able to like put your finger on something is pretty crazy. And that was like when I listened to Daft Punk shit and then, you know, and then it kind of came, really came back around when we got started DJing out more. You're like, oh, these are actually the best songs to ever play at a club of all time. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't understand it listening to a Daft Punk record in my room as a 13 year old or whatever, or however old I was. It was like, you just like, I don't know. It like gave itself context as I got older for sure. Mm -hmm. And when when you moved to New York, were you, were you DJing in New York prior to moving there? 
Yeah, no, I just moved there and got some gigs out the gate. I like met a, a guy who was a DJ there and I had an internship at a recording studio and I started, I was doing a production thing like during the day and then I'd go and play at like bar, like pretty much just like bar gigs. It was never even nothing. It was no house music, really. It was like mainly rap and like, you know, pop top 40 stuff. And then you'd play and then slowly like the kind of EDM thing happened and dance music got bigger and bigger. And then it was like everyone wanted like fucking dance remixes of pop songs. You know, you're playing like the Katy Perry song. It's just like pumping. <laughs> and then and then slowly dance music got cooler and cooler. And I feel like um, that's when we got kind of into it when like stuff like the bag raiders and cut copy and all that stuff mm -hmm. was coming out. It was like really exciting for us. And I was like, this is cool because it's like music and it's songs, but it's also dancey. It's not just like a two bar loop for 10 minutes. Like a lot of people considered like house music or techno back then, I feel like. And you guys were, were you living together at this point? Like you had not met each other and. Yeah, moved we lived together for, for years. Yeah. Yeah, we were living together for a while. Okay. How did you get into music? And, and you, uh, Ben was saying that you, uh, you're from originally from Brooklyn? No, I'm from the Bronx. Oh, Bronx, sorry. Okay, the Bronx. T talk to me about that a little bit. Uh, my dad is a musician in churches and he also oh. teaches school teaches music in school teaches a lot of music in school but um my mom also has uh five brothers and like four sisters and they're all musicians they all play organ uh so like just being around it a lot growing up it was kind of like the thing to do uh in my family oh that's uh, awesome yeah and what so, was the first, so what drew, like, what was the first instrument you drew to? I grew up playing, I mean, there was a piano in the house and I played drums and then I kind of like switched over to piano just cause it was there. And, uh, then I, uh, learned guitar and bass like years, years, years later, like after I had already moved in with them. Oh, okay. And were you in yeah. bands growing up or like, how did you, how'd you cut your teeth in the music world? I sang in, uh, I sang in church choir. I did like jazz rock in my high school. I was a high school in Connecticut. Okay. And, um, I did like I would play with my dad because like my dad was like he was like MDing church like musician like musical departments like the entire departments would come in and, like hire musicians and then like write songs for them and stuff like that and then he would like oh, play wow. like play for different churches on Sundays and like pretty much like like revamp their entire musical departments you know. Mm -hmm. and um i would go and i would be like his drummer for those gigs and oh, then wow so he'd put you in the band that's rad yeah and then like my mom would help him too it was kind of like a full family gig like my mom would be like the the choir director or choir directress or whatever and uh mm -hmm. they would like teach the songs together like we'd be in like rehearsals every fucking day for different choirs wow so yeah. you really got in, involved quickly. I've, I've heard a lot of artists talk about being, you know, when, if you're growing up in the church and especially music in the church, you get a, a lot of opportunities to perform in front of people. You must have been Yeah, it wasn't just like church on Sunday. It was like church on Sunday, like choir rehearsal on Monday, then like team choir rehearsal on Tuesday, then like our different churches choir rehearsal on Wednesday. And it was always like, like musicians rehearsal after choir rehearsal. It was like really just like always. So it was like in the church, like it's like it was like inside of a church like facility, like. Uh -huh. Did you ever Playing. have a ch opportunity to uh, like, you know, obviously you're doing the, the church thing, but were you ever able to kind of branch out and do something like on your own, like as far as like maybe with yeah, some group older, of handful of friends and stuff. When when I got older and, and like and like started like like when computers became a thing then I was like able to kind of like go and like be on a computer and like do and like discover other shit okay. that's like because before then I was kind of pretty much subject to like the music my parents were playing which was not bad like my, my dad was also playing like Earth and the Fire in the Crib oh cool so, like, church stuff and then kind of like this like faux church because Earth and Fire has got a lot of like churchy aspects to them but they were like just pop music mm -hmm. and uh but it was like what was allowed and, uh, oh okay you know what i'm saying like i wasn't listening yeah. to like yet but then the internet came and i was like oh this shit is fire so I, then <laughs> i started listening to like and like my homies put me up on like uh on like underground shit like uh back in the day like raucous records this was like when i was in high school uh -huh. and it would like go up and like download that kind of shit from the internet then i got into like biggie and all that kind of shit new york rap mm -hmm. a lot 
DMX or like that, just from like being around. Did you? But I, um, also, but I was also at that time still in the church, you know. So it was like this, like two sided kind of. You had thing. to like separate, yeah. It's kind of separate yeah. the two out, right? Yeah, like my parents. The church gigs. Yeah, the church gigs carried over because I'd be like DJing, and J Pat would be like out at my party, and then he'd be like, "Fuck, I got to get up and go play and fucking." He like had you remember you were like you're still yeah, playing doing for like a while, a while. yeah for gigs well, yeah you could go play on a sunday was, morning in the church of town or some shit the, the church thing did it, i was doing that for like a long 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 time that actually came back because i was um because i was like not doing it for a very long for a while i was because i was had already moved out and shit and then i needed money and my dad was like you should just like go play the, my dad has always knows some church that needs a musician so mm -hmm. he you just go play for this such and such a church that needs an organist and i was kind of like and eh, like my organ skills like are i but like they're pretty they're my, my dad is like a virtuoso so like I, don't know, I was like i don't want them to like expect you and get me and he was like no they just need a guy to show up and like play the song so i did that for a while and i mean it's honestly really good money it's, you go there for like an hour <laughs> and, it, and get paid a lot of money but i i mean i couldn't sustain that and we started like being on the road and stuff a lot and i was mm -hmm. teaching a lot more Okay. Do, did you go to college for music? And then how did you meet uh, Ben? Like, do you... I met Ben because I didn't go to college. I was supposed to be in college and I got, I, they dropped out and uh, I was You were still out. in school when I met you or you were like just, it was like I, you were like just, I, I mean, yeah. I came, I, oh, actually, yeah. Cause I met Ben actually, like when I met, met Ben, uh, I was like at St. John's and I was go going to, hang out in new these new school studios like every now and then and <laughs> our boy our our boy milo sorry was going to the new school and he was also a producer mm -hmm. i was going to hang out with them and then that's kind of like why i ish i dropped out because i was like doing all this other music shit, shit in the city and i kind of knew what i wanted to do mm -hmm. so i was like yeah i'm not going to just like be out here when really i'm trying to move into the city so then i moved into i made the decision to move to the city and he was looking for i'm sure he told you all this Oh, he said that you get. He just said we were kind of going on his backstory a little bit, but he said you guys ended up moving in together. Yeah, yeah. And, then, then, and I had already met him, and we were kind of like communicating online mm -hmm. and uh, like sending each other. Beats we, we just wanted to be. We just wanted to be rap producers. That was it. Was yeah, like, we wanted to be, be rap hip hop producers. I was deep was into like, the rap at this cool. point. We were like both deep into the rap, and. Then, <laughs> And, I and, then this, and then we realized how much the rap game kind of sucked and like uh, that was like the moment we were also like at the tail end of like cool rap like all the real good shit like telequality and all that kind of stuff that we loved it was just like rap was just starting to get like kind of bad and more like into the trappy kind of shit which was not our you know we were like backpacker guys yeah we're still trying to make like, beats for like the locks and stuff yeah we were trying to like keep up with the times and then we're like fuck this and then we kind of just fell in love with with dance music and like more pop stuff and then we wanted to be like dr luke and just like produce big pop songs for people which slowly turned into us not being able to make big pop songs but make like interesting pop leaning music and that turned kind of into the knocks i feel like because oh okay you know, so would like you we want would Sorry, you both what? like write you you what come up with instrumentals and beats together? <clears throat> yeah, Jay yeah. would what yeah. put like real instruments down, and then you were kind yeah. of doing the producing on the other end, Ben. Yeah, and then we like signed yeah. a publishing deal because we did a couple we sessions. A like, a yeah, and like we started getting in these LA sessions and that whole thing. We were like, trying, well, there was a step where we were like trying to be like pop these like pop writers. I don't know. Yeah. We had a phase. We had a phase. We were like in LA a bunch. Yeah. What was the first, like, how did you Trap get into up. LA? Like, how did you, was there a song or something, a beat or something somebody found and were like, oh, hey, like, I'd love to work with you. Or is it just networking we, we, online? We had developed a kid, kind of a, like a Samuel. song about a kid. Yeah, named Samuel, who we got a record Samuel. deal with Columbia. And that was like a big deal. And we went and did his whole album. He ended up getting dropped and none of the music really came out. But it was like, kind of our like intro to the whole music industry because we had yeah. this like, that we were developing and I was like, oh, who are these producers behind the whole thing? And then that opened up some doors with like Neon Gold Records, which is now still our record label actually. It was the first label that put out Knox songs. And they, at the time, were doing like Ellie Golding and Marina and the Diamonds and all this like interesting indie pop stuff, like Passion Pit and all this mm -hmm. shit. And we were like, oh, this is cool. And it yeah. felt more realistic than us trying to like get a Britney Spears song. And it was just like yeah, what we so liked. Like we didn't really like the music and it was the, the guys were cool. They became our friends. And then they put us on tour with Ellie Golding and like the rest kind of just like, well, yeah. Well, at the time we weren't even really trying to be artists. Yeah. We we're still be like these producer guys. Which oh, is okay. why 
which is why we were like in LA trying to like write pop songs and like we had to get we had the guy Samuel we were we were just we were like in his band yeah we played in his band and shit but we weren't like we weren't like the main guys you know like I was like singing harmonies and playing keys and shit and Ben was like playing drums and had like a keyboard thing but we were like you know we were just producers and I think we still like kind of were trying to be like the Neptunes kind of e with uh, okay. like producing for other people but not like being the people uh-huh. and then finally just started like be we. I don't know, we the, all the hottest music that we felt like we made was stuff that was like, I don't know, we would like be in the back of the studio, like fucking around mm-hmm. instead of in the main room. Like we, we used to like rent out our main room to like rappers to, <clears throat> to help pay for the rent and shit. So we had a setup in the back and we'd like fuck around and make like dance shit in the back. Mm-hmm. And we were like, we should just put this stuff out. And is that when you guys became the Knox when you decided to put those recordings out? No, we had already been the Knox as, oh, produ- okay. as producers for a while. As producers, we were- though, but yeah, the first like Knox songs that was what they were. Like we put out yeah, like, song, like can't like, shake your love. Blogs. <clears throat> yeah, it was like and it was like hype at the hype machine time. So like yeah, we were great. trying to be like hype machine dudes. Yeah, SoundCloud got really big and like it was cool because it was giving people opportunity like you know we just put the show on the internet with no label no anything and all of a sudden it was like got number one on hype machine oh which next is thing, huge i mean yeah back then. yeah at the time that was such a big deal and we're like oh my god and the next thing you know we have like like a bunch of people on soundcloud and like all of a sudden like labels are reaching out because of fucking hype machine you know what i mean it was like yeah. right it's it was like a weird time yeah. for the music industry because like the, the, the industry wasn't like sure like how, what to do about like all this like you know you, you kind of get big on your own in a way Mm-hmm. If you're the bedroom producer if you were able to get your stuff to, like to the blogs you know and if you went number one on hype machine that was I, like spotify going you know getting yet. a spotify yeah like being yeah, on spotify that wasn't at the time, it was, yeah at the time it was huge it was like we'd watch our sound it was like the biggest thing ever by thousands of plays every time you refresh it like it was really had so many people using it it was crazy um we owe a lot to the, like, the game we played for a while it's just like the hype machine blog game and that kind of really built our, our whole shit yeah. And what, from there, like, what would you say, like, the the next big like milestone moment for the for the group was? We had a song called "Dancing with the DJ," which was uh, the first song. We still put it out independently. We weren't on a label yet, but that blew up like on a whole another level where it was like international. Like, it was on the radio in Australia and it was in Japan. It was like number one on electronic charts in Japan. Wow. And it was just like it was like, and it was like actually built. It was kind of bubbled like the real old fashioned way where DJs were playing it, and it was like. You know, like people were really playing. Maddie on had it in his DJ set, which was a big deal at the time. And like, uh, it just like kind of really was an organic thing. And then that got us signed to, to a, a label we should never signed to, which was a, a deal through Interscope um, in Noctone, which that was like, okay, now we're signed. We signed like a big fuck off record deal and like, you know, so, uh, money we would never have been able to pay back. But that was like our first big chunk of money and like felt like, oh my, oh my God, we like signed a record deal. Next thing you know, we're like going to LA for sessions for the Knox, not like as producers. Yeah. We were like, all of a sudden we were like the artists in the room with producers, you know what I mean? Which mm-hmm. was weird, which was weird for us. And that like, I think fucked with our heads a lot. We're all of a sudden they're producing this room with like these pop people trying to make the sound that we made completely organically, like into something for top 40 and like radio. And like we were just so it was like, these, like, it was like the DJ story where it's like oh here's a record label handing you a check we're gonna take it and like expect everything's gonna be fine and long and story these, short like, really terrible yeah. ideas they tried to like get us you know they tr- it was like that like story you hear about a band signing to the record label and the record label like taking control and trying to like turn them into like this thing that they don't want to be you know oh, like, we, had yeah. song, we had the song dance with the dj and the hook was like this it's like a perfect like vocal that we like was just one of those magic moments with this like a friend of ours who went to jazz school and then they they were on some like oh what if we replace like the song is great but what if we replace her with kesha and like do this and it was like oh no this is what we're in for and then like, and it's like and it was like the guy with the money was the dude that was like making these suggestions yeah, and it was like yeah, and we were in and the room with all literally these that dudes. yeah and it was and it was like so cliche but at the end of the day it actually was fine because we ended up putting out an ep which we ended up we liked and like the label folded so we didn't have to pay anything back um, well, that works out right yeah so they just paid for like, the song? Yeah, yeah they paid for the tour support they paid for like some big budget videos and like kind of got us off the ground a little bit and then we were yeah, able we to just super lucky stay with yeah um and then then the next step after that was that song classic which is like probably one of our biggest songs and we made that i saw that you guys got a gold record for that yeah it's our first congratulations that's so thank you 
Um, and that, that was a that was a funny time because I was like, we had just got dropped from that label and we we're like, fuck, is this like the end? Like, what do we do now? Blah, blah, blah. And then we yeah. made that song just like on a random trip with some friends. And that opened up. And then I sent it to Derek from Neon Gold, who was like, had put out our very, very first song. And he was like, had just signed a, a deal with Atlantic for his label. So it all ended up working out where we signed with Atlantic, but with Neon Gold, who are mm -hmm. like our friends. And like, we felt very safe with them. And I don't think we would have signed another major label deal if it hadn't been with them, because it was like, these were literally our friends that we like spent all the, our Friday nights with and shit. So it was like, and these been kind of the a and of our whole career, which has been awesome. Yeah. Especially so after it was like a pretty green situation. And I feel like we had a little bit more ball in our court, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And we had just kind of like, I don't know, it, it was like, but that first deal also, was just like, delayed our career by like three left, years. We also left that deal with our entire album that we had made based for them pretty much. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like the best scenario, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You're, not, it was lucky. Yeah. you're not being told really what to do anymore and you get to leave with the record that they paid it was, for. It was because, it was because, <laughs> the, it was because the label had discovered their big act was Maroon 5. I don't know if you've heard of them. But oh like, no! Who, like, what songs do they have? <laughs> <laughs> but so they basically guy, sold off. They basically sold off like the label and be like, "Oh, we just want Maroon Five. Like all the other artists, like fucking who cares? Like you know what I mean? Like take it. Like we're we're gonna make so much money. We don't care if we lose this. Like other fucking three bands or whatever. Sure. Wow. Wow. And then that you put out the classic into what twenty? That was twenty fourteen. Pretty quickly after know. that, was that when you worked with uh, with Foster the People on Ride or Die? Yeah, probably uh, for a while after that oh what? Ride or die was a few years later yeah i feel like classic was even earlier in 2014 might have been like 2012 yeah it was like 2012 oh, okay because i want to because i like i said earlier i worked on a radio station and we played that record but it, i think it was like 2014 or 2015 when we played. i think it was later than that i think i think uh, Ride or die, 2017 even or oh it's, maybe it's, i'm it totally was our lost. second it was the second album yeah and that was like uh that was definitely a big that was like the next step it felt like for us having a song on alt radio which we never thought they always said like all these major labels always like you guys could like have a song on the radio and all and like the mod they used to call it modern rock i mean i'm sure you know it used to be like now they've changed it, i feel like more to alternative but it used to always mm -hmm. be like you could have a song on modern rock and we'd be in the meetings like modern rock have you heard our music <laughs> like how are we gonna have a song on modern rock radio and then the foster thing happened which was funny because like we had that demo forever it was just a beat our buddy made and then we had written a little top line and it was like our friends singing it and it was a uh, like the little pitched up voice and we we're like no the only person who could sing this would be mark foster because he's got that like high-pitched voice and it feels like that vibe and I, long story short i was in nicaragua for a new year's party and i met this guy who ended up being like best friends with mark foster oh wow and, I, and that's how we got it to him is like we hit up this guy and i was like hey i got this song i'd love like mark to sing it and he knew of us we had done a remix for them ages ago and mark which i thought someone like mark foster would never cut someone else that someone else like wrote the majority of mm -hmm um because he's like he's a really talented song he's a great musician and and he but he was down and he like and he was like we were in LA the next couple of weeks doing it and I was like that felt like a big like oh shit like this is gonna be like the like it just felt like the quintessential like Knox collaboration with the perfect song like mm -hmm. coming coming from that world of like you know of blog stuff when that's when like pumped up kicks was the biggest song in the world oh yeah and like it was them and MGMT were kind of running that whole world and they we looked up to both of them and then I just feel like all our fans were like, like, if you could, it was always like a dream thing. Like if you could collab with someone, we were always like, Foster the People would make such good sense for a Knox collab. It's like, they're just like indie enough and just pop enough where they sit in that in-between zone where they're not like, you know what I mean? They're not like cheesy pop, but they're not like Animal Collective, <laughs> you know? They're right, like, right, right, right. They're, like, they're like, right, they're right in that like, indie, they're like, the, like the, the definition of indie pop and it just really worked out. And I feel like that was like all of a sudden this like next step. So once, yeah, once you get the song on the radio, did that, like, was that the change? Like, did that change your career quite a bit? It did in the sense that just, like, kind of. Yeah, it did in a way. It was more just, like, cool to have people, like, that know of us, that have been fans forever, being able to get in their car in Minneapolis and hear our song on the radio and be like, I've been listening to this band for seven years, and now they finally have a song on the radio. You know what I mean? Because we had already been mm -hmm. around for a while. And, like, it we had definitely, something like that. It definitely changed, uh, I think, it changed, like, our second album was definitely way more indie like bandy kind of stuff because yeah. we were kind of we, we were kind of like we kind of like went in that direction because we had put ride or die out and uh and uh i think it was on it, it hit at indie or no not alt radio and like alt yeah. 
alt comes across alt reads as like bandy so then like our our second tour or not our second tour but our second album tour was uh way more like we had a full live band it was mad fun don't get me wrong but like mm-hmm. this is just what it was and then like i was like leading front manning like singing like full songs and shit like that um, yeah, definitely. I think that as, as much as Ride or Die was great, it also fucked with our heads having a song on the radio. Yeah, as, it, really? as a lot of it's, again, it's the cliche story that everyone <laughs> tells. Like, you get a song on the radio, and all of a sudden you think you need to make songs for the radio. You know what I mean? When yeah, really, like, our second album was definitely like trying to make songs for the radio, like song yeah, songs. We didn't, where like we come from making songs like Dance with the DJ. That's like more of like a disco house kind of a thing. Right. Like, I mean, it's like there's a the verse to it. Yeah, and the thing about Ride or Die, it's not like we went into that song. Like, I told you the way it was made. It wasn't like we sat down in a studio, like, let's make a yeah, song. Yeah, like super organic. It just happened. So that's like, that's what always happens. Like, you can't, you, you just can't bottle that shit. Like, it happens. Can't, if, I had, sure. if I hadn't gone to Nicaragua, Ride or Die wouldn't have happened. There's all these X factors of, like, hit songs, I feel like, mm-hmm. that just, like, they just happen. It's never in the studio when they're like, let's make a hit, and then you make it. It just never works that yeah. way. Did that open the door? Because obviously you've collaborated and worked with a ton of artists and wrote for a bunch of artists. Now, did did that open up that world for you guys, or are you doing definitely, that quite a bit prior? Gave us a new, yeah, it definitely gave us a new sense of cred a little bit. I think with some kind of yeah, and it opened up and our, our live show. And our live show is super dope, like super dope. Yeah. Oh, the live show changes. Okay, yeah, yeah. and more of and more like alternative artists. I think were open to collaborate with us. You know, like since then we've been able to work with you know we have a song with cold war kids and we have a song Mm -hmm. with uh like you know cannons and a lot of these kind of like bands that probably live in the alt radio space but like this time on this album kind of to transfer where we're going yeah uh, the we use a lot of the like we have a song with cannons on the album we have a song with um cold war kids and whatnot and but this time i think instead of like being like okay we need to make it sound like alternative or whatever we stuck to kind of our electronic space and just had them come to our world a little more um which i think is kind of what makes this album one of my favorites because it feels like a return to form in the sense that we're sticking to our guns of that original sound uh-huh. and, but it, but it also is still touching to that to kind of the stuff that people know us for which is that more like indie pop thing but we didn't I don't know. It's a we, good, just it's a like good we, mix. We, had, we kind of stuck to our guns a little bit more and i feel like we've just been in the game for so long that now like we trusted our ear a little more. What and we I weren't so like, better... oh, we need to get a hit. Do we need to go to the radio. Do we need to make that? Like it was just like this is what we're doing and this is what we want to do, which is cool. Mm-hmm. I think it's a good mix of both, both yeah. of our uh, sides, like our mm-hmm. like DJ side and our and our like bandy side, mm-hmm. indie side or whatever. This album is a good mix of that. I feel like in the alternative world too, just coming from that land and that radio <laughs> world, uh, like it, it has shifted quite a bit. I mean, with that yeah. sound, I mean, there's not, it's bands going to, to radio or aren't as like, aren't like when you think of alternative radio, like I'm thinking like, no, it's like oh, we were saying earlier, it's like Machine Gun Kelly. It's like, yeah, yeah rock. It's, it's like basically not, it's not rock. Really rock. It's so yeah, different. It's different. I think yeah, even Halsey's new like, record was being played on alt radio. Like yeah, it just, and it's like, and there's full like dance, like even that, like again, that band Cannons, it's like a full like 80s pop song. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, I think there's like, you know, it's like very synth, like synth pop stuff. And like, you know, I think they played Tove Low on alternative radio. It's like everything is very, uh, it's kind of blurry over there. Yeah, the lines are definitely getting blurred over there. And now it's like they're a stepping stone for trying to cut things into like top, top 40, right? Like right, Portugal the like, Man it, or Glass yeah, Animals. Is it cross over? Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting time over there <laughs> at alternative radio. It's time everywhere. Music, music is in a weird place at the moment. Sure. Well, now that I'm, I've re looked up and my timing is so awful because I didn't realize, you know, with COVID and everything, I can't get my barriers on time. That was 2018 when we were playing your record. So, <laughs> not oh, 2014. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been a few years. <laughs> um, but so I was curious where you were when, when COVID happened. Were you working on a record or were you on the road or? Yeah, we, we were, were actually- in LA working on a record. Yeah. And did we that had a house. Work. Yeah, we had a house. Yeah, this, record. yeah, this record that's coming out was started basically two months or three months before COVID hit. So oh, wow. Working on those songs. Uh, like, we were literally at a house that we rented in LA. Like, we had just written the Mall Rat song. We did the Muna song. We did uh, the Teed song, all in this house in LA. We were having a great fucking time. We like were, I feel like we were just hitting our mark on all these sessions. We were like getting all these records we were really excited about. 
mm -hmm. a new format, new formula for us of like renting a house and having a studio in the house and having artists come to us. And like, it worked out really well, but literally we left, ended up cutting the trip short because it was like the week that they were like, oh, Coachella's canceled. Oh, NFL shut down, NBA shut down or whatever. We're all just like, uh, we got to get home. And we bounced. Yeah, we left a couple of days early. And it was like a good thing because like as soon as we got home, like the week after, they like stopped everything the travel shut down. and like everything got yeah. and like every everything shut down. It was like, oh shit, this is like a big, big deal. So then right. the rest, the, obviously the rest of the, the, the record was done. A lot of it was done during pandemic, like just remotely, a lot of stuff going back and forth. I th I'm really grateful that we had even had that first month because we had a lot of tracks and ideas started all in the mm -hmm. same room. Um, but after that, it was kind of like, it was tough because we were putting out some singles that we made during the pandemic remotely just to kind of like keep a flow. Everyone didn't know what to do. You're like, do we put songs out? Is it like disrespectful to put a song out right now? Right. Is it weird? Like, is it any point? Are people listening to music right now? And then everyone's like, people are only listening to old music that keeps them like safe. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> somebody had, everyone had these like different ideas of what was going on in music. We're like, are we ever gonna play shows again? It's like this whole thing. So we were just like, all right, let's put out some songs. Like we both started our own side project things. I think just like keep us, ourselves busy a little bit too. And like, I don't know, it was a weird time, but we ended up making this record. And I think a lot of it, Honestly, I, the reason I'm so proud of it is I think we had so much time to like sit on them. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like some of these songs, like the Teed song was the first song we made in LA, which was, I don't know, at this point, like three years ago. And like, we only were just putting the final touches on it like a few months, a couple months before it came out. So it's like, you have all this time to sit on it and be like, how did it, how did it like, you never get that. You never get to make a record then sit on it for two years and then be like, I mean, I guess some people do. Some people take some a people. long time, but we, we yeah we we don't usually take that long so like it was nice to have this time to be like okay like this how how has this has this song aged you know like mm -hmm. do i still do i still get as excited about it as i did when we first made it and there were a bunch of songs that we didn't and a bunch of songs that we did and whatnot and i think having that like time to step back and like maybe not listen to it for fucking two months and then step back with fresh ears mm -hmm. gives you such a perspective and makes you really be like okay this is great like i still get the same excitement from this now than i did when we made it um, which is a cool thing. It makes me want to take that much time to make every album, honestly. <laughs> we could afford it. I was I wonder <laughs> if it's a if it was gonna be a blessing and a curse in the sense that maybe you were gonna sit on it too long, but it sounds like you kind of put it down and you're like, okay, I'll revisit yeah, this. That's in a the little thing. Bit. They're, they're, you're right. Cause if I had just if we had just been working on it like for like every day, it would have been a whole other song. We probably would have ruined half the songs. <laughs> yeah, um, just like, okay, and then you change it and then you're like, oh, what am I you all know, of a sudden you, don't, you yeah. lost your whole yeah, you lose the plot. But you know, I think we did a, a good job of kind of stepping back and like making sure we were working on other stuff in the in the time being. Like I made a whole like lo-fi house project that was completely different from Knox stuff. And it just was nice like have that brain to go work on a whole nother album and be like, okay, let's go back to Knox stuff fresh now and like think about how, you know, and I like became a better producer from working on my own stuff. I feel I don't know. It was just it it felt like weirdly beneficial to us which is i kind of feel guilty saying that that the pandemic was beneficial but i feel like it kind of was for us with a song like walking on water like you know you said you mentioned that was like one of the early ones that you started uh but with like getting t to do it was that somebody you already knew like okay when you reach out to the artist to feature on the record or mall rat or whoever do you have them in mind or like how does that uh that song that song work? that song we actually wrote in the room with him and oh, then okay but at the time he was actually on some, like he wasn't trying to feature on anyone's and he like make it, it gave us that disclosure. I mean, like disclaimer, I mean, he's like a homie now. So it's like all good. But at the time we didn't really know him and we were like, oh, this sucks. Like he's telling us already that he doesn't want to feature on the song. And then we, and then we wrote the song and it was like such a great song. And it's the most like teed sounding vocal of all time. And I was mm -hmm. just like, how is it not going to be teed on this song? You know, I was like, I was like, and we were kind of like disheartened by it a little bit because he was, I mean, I get it. You know, when you're a new artist, when you're an artist and you're, he was about to put out in his own new music, he didn't want to be a feature on anything. Um, but then again, thanks to the fucking two years of sitting around, when we brought it back around, he hit us up like, man, the song rules. Like, I want to be on this actually. And like, oh, wow. Yeah. So then we ended up keeping him on it. Thank God. And now he's great. I mean, I'm working on a song with him right now for his album and shit. Like, um, but it was like one of those things where like if we had had to finish the record in time as you normally would we probably wouldn't have been able to have teed on it mm -hmm. but the yeah. other songs for example like like Ma the mall rat song all right one we made with her too in the room oh you did so not yeah, loved it right away yeah okay that's what we're trying to do more versus because it's the pitch thing like really gets old like it doesn't really work that well especially like with our credible artists like some like grace mall rat or mm -hmm. or teed or cold war kids 
they're not going to like take a song that's already written. Like the foster thing was kind of like a, a we got lucky, but uh, a lot of times we like, we'll go work with like writers and not have an artist for a song. And then the song just sits around and never gets cut because like no one that we like, or that's like cool enough. will want to take someone else's song. They always want to do it themselves. And we always get the best shit when like Muna, the song we wrote with them in the room. Mm -hmm. so that that's also been the benefit of like, I think having a little bit more credibility and success over the years is that now we can like get in the room with those people versus uh, okay yeah versus versus, versus to having to like send them shit and be like please write to this or like do you like that you know what i mean now we can get in the room and like and we and like that's why la felt so good because we got in the room with these people that we really wanted to work with and we like got a song out of each one of them you know mm -hmm. and you had foster the people back on the record too with yeah. all about you and was that one that you got to work directly with mark on that one or was it similar to ride or oh, die we, start, we started it in the room with him we right started it in the room yeah. with him. he just like happened to be in new york one <clears throat> he just happened to be in new york one day we were in the studio yeah and, and then the pandemic about, happened by yeah and then like that kind of just happened and we like had that for a while yeah okay yeah we and, had, um, i had the beat and then we had, we, like, actually, had the beat for a while yeah. That, that's yeah, another yeah. one where that someone else had actually written the top the original top line too and he cut it too but he changed yeah. it a lot but it was during the pan it was, it was full mid pandemic though like we we sent it to him and we we're like hey remember this and he's like oh man this is great and then he cut it and he was like just sitting around in the studio and that was the other thing that was kind of good about the pandemic honestly was all these people that we wanted to work with were all sitting at home right like with studio setups in their crib and like have we got so many ideas from people because they're like i have nothing else to do oh the Knox are making an album sure i'll try to write something for it and like usually they're always on tour they're finishing their record they're like on vacation you know what i mean like especially the bigger artists right you couldn't no one had any excuses everyone was we knew you were at home like we know you're home now <laughs> <laughs> but work on this shit please um Funny. so that was kind of to our benefit as well i love the ep you put out with yeah, with the covers you did with Foster the People, Southside oh, okay. and Devil's Haircut and Bittersweet yeah. Sympathy. Those are great choice yeah, that was, that was choices fun. or records. Yeah, that, was fun. that was like another like pandemic. What do we do? Let's just like do these things like. And it was it was fun. And those are like some of my favorite records from that era. And it's like kind of scary to to remake those songs. But I feel like we did it. Justice. Did a great job. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, yeah. Was it hard to choose on those or were those the three? Yeah, like, it was. Know? It was, but when Mark's voice is so specific, it's like, it kind of like cut down a lot of options. Oh, he has right. a specific tone, you know, like the Beck song was such a perfect fit. And like the Moby, one, I don't know. It was just like, it was cool. Yeah. It was a fun experience, yeah. That's awesome. And, and it was hard because we like made it in like a week. Like we were just like, let's do this. And like, we hadn't done that in a while where you don't like sit on shit. Like there's the opposite of what I was just saying. It's like, we just like banged it out and we're like, this is it. Let's, it felt like almost the SoundCloud days where we were like, let's just make this thing and throw it out and see what happens, you know? Uh -huh. I love it. I think it's, I mean, I like the, obviously the new songs you're putting out too, but I was, I was checking that one out too recently. I'm like, God, this is really, really rad. And it like just brings me back to like, you know, yeah. as a kid hearing Bittersweet Symphony on some alternative radio station or whatever, okay. but yeah, all the time. Um, and you have a tour coming up too. Yeah. End of March. Right. Excited for that. Have you done any, a lot of shows yet or no? No, not really. Just been DJ. I mean, DJ. Really, we we haven't done a live been, show. We haven't done a live show. But so, we uh, just we just started putting it together. Like we had our first kind of rehearsal or like pre pre production thing, and it was it's cool. It's like it's it's kind of nerve wracking getting a live show together after not playing live for like fucking it's four, like, four it's years. Like three or four years. Yeah, we haven't played. But like I I kind of felt the feeling coming. You know, even being in the room with our with our music director and like putting the songs together and like getting the gear going. I was like, oh, I remember this. Like this feels like another lifetime. But like this is fun. I remember why I like this sometimes. It feels like good, but it feels different just because like everything's different now. But it feels. It feels vaguely familiar. Yeah, I think once we're on stage and doing it, it'll like it's like riding a bike. But it definitely, I have some weird. It's like everyone, everyone who I've talked to that's been back in the game has said that like once you, like it's been it was weird, but then once you get on stage, it's like the same. Yeah. So okay. we'll see. Good. I mean, yeah, that's. I can't wait to. Hear, I mean, the the record that's out, the songs that are out now are awesome, and uh, the support you're gonna get is gonna be dope as well. So that's awesome. Thanks, Thanks dude. Man. Yeah, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to hang out with me today. Hey, really, really appreciate it. Um, I have one more question for for both of you. I want to see if I can get an answer from each of you. If you have any advice for aspiring artists, JP, you go first. Mm -hmm. Do I have any any advice for aspiring artists? Hmm. Sure. Um, it's not easy, but it's not supposed to be, and don't treat it like a hobby. 
because if you treat it like a hobby, it's always going to be a hobby. So dive in, be prepared to fail and, and learn from your failures. Be consistent. I love it. What about you, Ben? Uh, yeah, I'd say, I mean, I think the best advice is, is don't treat it like a hobby. I think, I think you have to eat, sleep and breathe it. And like, just every day and all day do it. Um, which I think is kind of getting lost these days. I think a lot of people try to spread themselves too thin or like try to kind of find the shortcuts, you know, like there's a lot of technology out there that makes it, uh, seem like easier to make music. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if you do your homework, the ones that are really the greats and the ones that actually end up sustaining are ones that have put in their hours, whether it's an instrument or being on being a producer or whatever songwriter. It's just a. I just think there's no like yeah I think that's I think that's the best advice. It's not a hobby. There's no quick way, you know. I just feel like I'm, if a lot of people think there's a lot of quick success these days, and maybe there is, you know, you get popping on TikTok or the internet for a second. But as as someone who as a band that's I, mean, I guess a band whatever a duo that's been around now for over 10 years and we've been able to survive off this without having you know we don't have like an obvious top 40 hit we don't have that song or that that moment that everyone's like oh that's the knocks they blew up off the, it's just kind of like we, we really also like, have like day jobs yeah we, we we've like just kind of had this constant you know slow rise type thing and it and it's uh i wouldn't trade it for anything honestly i think we kind of had the ideal situation you know mm -hmm. um i mean obviously having a quick hit would be great at, at moments, but now I feel like um, those are even fewer and far between. And I think the ones that really, if you really want to make a career out of this, you got to just spend the hours, you know, spend the time. Bring me a bad word.